Welcome back, students. This is Module 6.1.4. Uh, this is about superclass tetrapoda, which of course falls under subphylum vertebrata. Uh, this is the group, the tetrapods, that the, the ancestors of the coelacanths gave, gave rise to. So this is when fishes became amphibians in this transition. And superclass tetrapoda has some features that are easy to remember. It has a one, two, three, four, five features, or one, two, three, four, five characteristics. This is an example of organizing your material in a way, in the order, where it's easier to remember. For example, feature number one is one bony endoskeleton. Uh, feature number two is two internal nostrils, or nares. Uh, feature number three is a three-chambered heart minimum. So you can have a three- or a four-chambered heart in this group of tetrapoda. Uh, and feature number four is to have four appendages. This is the feature for which tetrapoda is named. Tetrapoda means four legs, and so having four appendages or four legs. And feature number five is having five digits on each of these legs. That's the ancestral condition to be pen, penodactyl, uh, which means pentadactyl, which means to have four, I'm sorry, means to have five digits on each of your four legs. And this superclass, superclass tetrapoda, includes four classes, class amphibia, class reptilia, class aves, and class mammalia. And all have some terrestrial features. Now, here we can see that indeed tetrapods, uh, tetrapods have four legs. Let's count them. Let's see. One, two, three, four. Uh-oh. There's another one. Five. Hmm. Kind of an interesting uh, dilemma there. Um, uh, we're going to start off in, in a way that you might think is kind of funny, but we're going to discuss uh, what kind of chemicals these animals excrete in their urinary system. So we're going to look at the excretory waste products of some of these uh, uh, tetrapods. And uh, in fact, of vertebrates in general, not just tetrapods. Okay, there are three common excretory waste products in vertebrates. <clears throat> Ammonia, urea, and uric acid. Now, across here, I have four features. How energetically expensive it is to make the particular molecule. So bigger molecules, you have to make more bonds. They're energetically more expensive. Smaller molecules are simpler. They require less energy. Uh, toxicity. Uh, this is how toxic these chemicals are. And it turns out that simpler ones are more toxic and more complex ones are less toxic. And, of course, with greater toxicity uh, comes a greater necessity for dilution. And, therefore, you save uh, less water if you have more toxic uh, waste products. And then we're talking about solubility of these products in water. So let's look first at ammonia. Ammonia is a very simple molecule and it is very cheap to make, so it is not energetically expensive, but it is very toxic. If you have smelled strong ammonia, it'll snap your head back. Uh, it can even make you faint if it's strong enough. And water savings is minimal because you need a lot of water to dilute ammonia. And since ammonia is a liquid, it is very soluble in water. And it is water soluble as a polar substance, and so it uh, dissolves very well in water. And ammonia is typically used uh, by fishes and uh, larval amphibians as their primary waste product. The next uh, excretory waste product is urea. Urea is more complex than ammonia, so it, it has more energetic expense to build. Its toxicity, however, is reduced. Uh, it has a little bit of water savings because it's not as toxic, and it's semi-soluble. Urea is, in addition to being an excretory waste product that adult amphibians and uh, mammals excrete. This is a primary excretory waste product of humans, for example. Uh, but urea is also a plant fertilizer because it has nitrogen in it, and nitrogen is one of the limiting uh, nutrients of plants. And so I've had the experience of trying to dissolve little pellets of urea 
in water so I could put it into an irrigation drip system for grapes. And it's pretty, it can be tough to dissolve it. It's not easy. Had to stir it and use quite a bit of water. Uh, the third and final type of excretory waste product that we're going to consider is uric acid. Uh, uric acid. This is a large complex molecule compared to the others and it requires more energy to manufacture it. Uh, however, it is a non-toxic material. Uh, it is, in fact, a a, a crystalline material. Uh, its water savings is very, very high, and uh, it's non-soluble in water. It comes out as a semi-solid paste. Uh, and animals that excrete uric acid, well, these include birds and reptiles. And of course, some people would consider birds to be reptiles. Uh, but there you go. Uh, having said that, let us go ahead and explore the first class in superclass tetrapoda, the four-legged uh, vertebrates. And this would be class amphibia. The word amphibia, its etymology, ampha means double, and bia, as is in biology, means lives. And so ampha Amphibia means double lives, and this is in reference to the fact that amphibians typically have an aquatic larva and a terrestrial or semi-terrestrial adult. The common names of the animals within the class amphibia include frogs and toads, salamanders and newts, and something called Sicilians, but it's spelled kind of odd. Uh, let's look at the features of this class. These animals have smooth, moist skin. Typically, it's glandular to keep it moist. They have mucous glands to keep it moist. Uh, but the skin's very permeable and subject to drying. Uh, and often the skin, in addition to having mucous glands, also has poison glands. So some of the most interesting poisons known are from amphibian skins, and some of them are very powerful as well. Uh, these animals typically undergo a metamorphosis, hence the class name the double life, from a gilled aquatic larva. In frogs, we call it a tadpole, uh, but it goes from a gilled aquatic larva to an air-breathing adult. Uh, and these animals are considered semi-terrestrial at best because the majority, but not all, uh, must return to water to breed, to reproduce. Uh, these animals excrete urea as adults and ammonia as uh, larvae. They have something called a cloaca, which we'll explore a little bit later. They have a three-chambered heart that we'll also look at. Uh, these animals are ectothermal, uh, which some people consider this to be cold-blooded, but ectothermal means they get their body temperature from outside their bodies, from the environment, and they can... Uh, amphibians, to a limited extent, can control their body temperature through their behavior. Reptiles are the masters of behavioral regulation, behavioral thermal regulation, but amphibians can do it a little bit. So when an amphibian's cold, it'll get in the sun, and when it's hot, it'll get in the shade or get in the water. Uh, and that's behavioral thermal regulation. Uh, they have different patterns of reproduction. We'll look at them with regard to frogs and salamanders. And then the senses, these animals... Well, at least frogs have a tympanum, which is an eardrum. They have a pair of them. So the round discs you see on the heads of uh, frogs and toads are eardrums. Uh, these animals also have a Jacobson's organ, which is a chemosensory organ found in the roof of the mouth. And as larvae, they have lateral lines, just like the fishes of Pisces, including chondrichthys and osteichthys. So kind of some interesting uh, combinations there. Um, I'm going to draw for you uh, the three-chambered heart right here on this slide. I know I don't have much room, but it's okay. We'll make it work. Um, so you should make a drawing uh, on your paper. I think there's a space there. And so this will be the three-chambered heart of amphibians. So first you're going to draw two chambers that look kind of like Mickey Mouse ears. Then we're going to draw a third chamber down here. So now we're going to finish drawing these and see that they go like this. Now, the two chambers on top, which look like Mickey Mouse ears, these are called atria. And so this is, and this is, although you might, you might not think this, this is the right atrium. And it's the right one because we're looking at the animal. Right atrium 
This is the left atrium. And here on the bottom is a single ventricle. Now, an atrium is a chamber that receives blood from the body, and a ventricle is a heart chamber that pumps blood to the body. So the right atrium will receive blood from the body. So I'm going to make a little line here and like this and put an arrow on it, and I'm going to put here from the body. And so when the blood comes from the body, it's depleted of oxygen. So it goes into the right atrium, then it goes to the ventricle, where it will go out, and it goes to the lungs, typically. And in amphibians, it can also go to the skin. They can use their skin to breathe. Um, and then there, oops, sorry guys. There it gets oxygenated. And so when it comes back to the left atrium, it has high levels of oxygen. And then from the right, uh, the, um, excuse me, from the left atrium, it will then go out to the body where the oxygen from the lungs will be used. And that's the way it goes. This is called a double loop circulatory pattern. But there is a problem here, and that is that in the single ventricle, there is mixing of blood with high and low levels of oxygen. You should write this down somewhere, that the problem with the three-chambered heart, three-chambered heart, is mixing of blood, oops, B-L-O-O-D, with high and low oxygen levels, O2 levels. And that's the problem. They actually have a structure in here called the spiral valve, uh, which is like an incipient septum dividing that ventricle into two, but it's not completely divided, so there's still mixing of uh, blood with high and low levels of oxygen uh, within it. So this is what my drawing looks like, and you should have a drawing that's better than mine since you pre presumably had more space. And here is a three-chambered heart that they draw. I don't like it nearly as well as ours, uh, but you get the idea. And so this is, they're showing, of course, this is more anatomically correct where the drainage out of the ventricle goes up in a, a single arterial trunk. Uh, but there we go. Anyway, uh, we also want to learn about a structure called the cloaca. A cloaca is a different type of plumbing than you're used to. You're used to the type of plumbing that you have, in which you have a separate urogenital opening, uh, for, which is used for urination and for reproduction, and a separate anal opening, which is used for expelling feces and waste. But in animals that have a cloaca, there's a different arrangement. A cloaca is called a chamber. Uh, and it, it, a cloaca is a chamber that receives products from three systems, from the digestive, the excretory, and the reproductive systems. Okay, and I don't like this picture very much, so ignore this picture. Um, but so that's what a cloaca is. The the word cloaca actually means sewer. Cloaca maxima in Rome was the big sewer, and this was the opening right here through which the sewage of Rome flowed out. <laughs> and this is kind of a silly question. Of course, it's called a sewer because it contains both urine and feces. Uh, it also contains gametes for reproduction. Now look at, you should know which groups have a cloaca, uh, and sharks have a cloaca. I didn't mention them when we were talking about chondrichthys, but they do. Amphibians, which we're talking about now, have a cloaca. Reptiles, birds, and some primitive mammals. Think of egg-laying mammals like an echidna and a platypus. They have a cloaca. And a single opening to the outside of the body through which uh, the products from these three systems uh, exit is called the vent. Okay, so when you look underneath, you see a single opening. Uh, when we dissect our frog, uh, you'll see uh, the vent of, of the frog. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and talk about some of the groups. There are three groups of uh, amphibians that we're going to learn. The first are the frogs. Frogs are not on the main line of vertebrate evolution because they have become specialized. They have become specialized for jumping. They have a short neck. They have reduced digits. They have no tail. 
Uh, these animals have external fertilization. So a frog will typically, a male frog will typically set up a calling station and he'll vocalize. Sometimes they have big vocal sacs in which amplifies their calls. And any female that comes in there, uh, this is uh, construed as consent to mate. And mating takes place when the male grasps the female around the waist from behind. This is in a mating grip that is called amplexus. So amplexus is the mating grip of uh, frogs, and the female will, redu will uh, release eggs out into the water, and the male will fertilize them outside of her body. And so this grip amplexus. Sometimes the males have special little pads so they can hold on to the female in amplexus. Amplexus, excuse me. Um, and uh, as I mentioned already, the frogs typically have powers of vocalization. So frog calls are kind of like bird song. They're uh, species specific and they have kind of two meanings, sex and violence. I just told you about the sex meaning. But if another male enters a male's calling station, then the males may have a, a fight. And so there's the violence, I guess. Uh, frogs have a water egg also known as a jelly egg, and here it is right here in the lower right. And one of the questions that people sometimes have is, what's the difference between a frog and a toad? Now, all frogs have these features of being specialized for jumping, and these include frogs and toads. But toads are especially uh, adapted for dry habitats. So they will have a thickened skin, which doesn't dry out as much. This is a toad right here. This is a frog right here. And the fro uh, toads often have, uh, as well, I don't know that I see it that well, they often have poison glands right here. These are called parotid glands, and they produce toxins uh, that can be dangerous. We have the... Uh, what is called the Sonoran toad, used to be called the Colorado River toad, but it gets down here in southeastern Arizona. And it's kind of a large, smoothish looking toad that has big parotid glands, and it will poison your dog to a dangerous level. So if your dog is mouthing one of these toads, take it away from it and rinse out its mouth. And remember when you're rinsing a dog's mouth, you're not putting the hose down its mouth and making the water go down its throat, but you're washing it sideways out, just rinsing the toxins. Uh, out. So something to remember. So let's look at the second group of amphibians under class amphibia. These are the salamanders. Salamanders, I told you frogs weren't on the main line of vertebrate evolution. Salamanders are more so. They're the typical amphibian. They have a neck. They have a tail. So you can kind of see up here the, the form of a typical salamander. Uh, salamanders, when they reproduce, they have internal fertilization, which is different than frogs. And they typically, a male will uh, do a courtship dance for a female. He might have color spots on his tail and wave his tail in front of the female's face. And this is all, there's a series of uh, nonverbal cues. For the most part, salamanders don't vocalize. They, they, there are a few that can make a little uh, kind of a, I don't know, I don't want to call it a chirp, but a single note kind of call. But they usually do it in distress, uh, forcing air out of their lungs or something like that. But in any case, during the courtship dance, the male will woo the female. And when she consents to mate, the male uh, will pick up her nonverbal signals and he will take from his body a package of sperm called a spermatophore. And he'll put it on the substrate, and the female will put it into her own vent. And so there's sperm inside the spermatophore, and so that is internal fertilization. Uh, even though it's not sex like you think of sex, it's sex as salamanders think of sex. And this is considered internal fertilization. Now, down here, we can, uh, on the bottom left, we can see a giant Chinese salamander. It's the largest salamander in the world. Uh, there's also a Japanese giant salamander, also very large, very rare, both of them. Uh, on the lower right, we can see an axolotl, and you can see that this is typical of the larva of a salamander. They have external gills, but the axolotl is special because it never grows up. It never loses those gills and becomes an air breather, but it retains those gills throughout its, throughout its life. Let's look at the third and final group of uh, amphibians. Uh, 
Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Before we do that, we wanted, I'm skipping this last point on this slide. What's the difference between salamanders and lizards? Uh, because they have the same morphological uh, appearance. They have four limbs, a tail, and a neck. So what are features that distinguish them? Well, here they are listed right here. First of all, uh, you might recognize this. This is one of our dissection trays. Uh, but this is a faded salamander, and this is a, a lizard. And how do they differ? Well, salamanders lack scales, they lack claws, and they lack ear openings. These are all features that lizards have, and... Uh, salamanders uh, lack. So this is a, a good way to distinguish them. Of course, salamanders are much more aquatic. Lizards are very terrestrial, although there are salamanders that walk on the ground and lizards that swim in the water. Uh, it's a general pattern. So now let's look at the third group of amphibians. These are the Sicilians. These are legless amphibians. These are burrowing forms, so they're out of sight, and they live in heavily vegetated areas of the tropics, so we don't know very much about them. But the, if you look at this, this kind of looks like an earthworm here, but if you look, you can see that it has an eye spot, a nostril, and a hinged jaw, so it's like no worm you ever saw. And of course, these can be very large. A form like this might be three to four feet long and thick in diameter. And so these animals are all predatory. Um, and again, we don't know all that much about them. But it's a group that you should have at least heard of before, and now you, now you have. Uh, the fact of the matter is that on a global scale, amphibians are disappearing. And there are many causes of this. And of course, in this sense, they are kind of like canaries in a mine. They serve as a warning. Uh, you may know that miners used to carry in a cage a canary, and then when they looked over at the canary and it had fallen down and fainted because of poisonous gases, they would run out of the mine. So canaries were an early warning system for miners. And that's kind of what amphibians are, and we see amphibian populations plummeting all around the earth. It should be a warning for us, and yet we continue with business as usual, not paying attention to our dying canary in the cage, the amphibians. Anyway, um, habitat loss, exotic species, climate change, increased ultraviolet radiation, uh, spread of certain diseases, uh, pesticides in water, water pollution, all these things have caused global populations of amphibians to greatly diminish. Some species that were very common have become rare. I, for example, in California, I grew up with the western toad, uh, Bufo boreus, and it's uh, supposedly very rare now. The Yosemite toad, uh, a toad from a national park uh, up in the mountains of California, has disappeared. And so, and this is inside a protected park. And so it shows that the physical conditions, <coughs> excuse me, are such that uh, this animal can no longer thrive. Uh, before we leave this module, before we close it, we want to just compare aquatic and terrestrial habitats uh, and kind of set the stage for the uh, colonization of land by tetrapodes. Uh, for example, we can look at the levels of oxygen, and we can see the air that you're breathing is about 21% oxygen. In water, it varies, but 1% is kind of typical, a very low level of oxygen. Cold water has more oxygen than warm water, so I have cold water and warm water fishes. Trouts and salmon need uh, cooler water with higher oxygen levels, and other fishes like uh, uh, panfish, such as bluegills or green sunfish, and bass uh, can live in warm water that have lower levels. Anyway, a second feature uh, that we can compare is the density of the media. Water is about 820 times denser than air, and so water provides support, physical support. And so if you're going to uh, go into an aerial or terrestrial environment, you're going to have to have a stronger skeleton than if you live in the water. Uh, a third feature in which we can compare between terrestrial and aquatic environments is how insulated they are. That is, how easily they change temperature. Water changes temperature much less easily than does air, uh, and that has to do with hydrogen bonds. I, you may or may not remember that. Um, and also, we can consider a historical view. Uh, 
back in the day, <laughs> going back far back in history, there were no vertebrates on land and there were many vertebrates in water. And so land could be seen as a refuge from predators and competitors. And so it was an opportunity for the first lineage of animals to arrive. And with that, we'll close this module.